Um, and this chapter is pretty important because it changes how we're going to treat our patients in a couple of different ways. So we have, you know, different priorities. If you think about how you thought or how you saw the world when you were six years old, if you can even remember, I know I have a hard time remembering that far back, or how you saw the world when you were 16 years old, um, how you see the world now. And if you can, we're going to talk a little bit about how you see the world a little bit older. Um, the way that people's priorities change is going to change how we interact with them. The way that you talk to somebody that's in their 20s, that's a patient, is not going to be how you approach somebody that's in their 50s or even 70s, especially um, in regards to, you know, we give everybody respect, yes, but some some people, their idea of respect is a little bit different as they get older. You call somebody sir and ma'am when they're in their 20s, they may or may not be receptive to that. You call somebody Bob when they're 60 and they're going to be like, that's sir to you or Mr. So-and-so. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that tonight. We're also going to talk about it from a physiologic standpoint. Vital signs drastically different for a an infant versus an adult. Um, you're going to be faced with questions on our tests as well as especially the registry, where it tells you you respond to such and such age, blah blah blah, and here's all their vitals. And if you miss the fact that they're six years old, their vitals are going to look horrible. And you're like, oh, my God, this guy's having a heart attack. And it's because you're thinking that it's an adult because that's the bulk of this class. We're talking about adults. But um, you just have to understand that, you know, children, their vital signs are different. They breathe faster. Their heart rates are faster. Their blood pressure is much lower. And if you saw that in an adult, it would look like they were going into shock. Um, so that's kind of what we're going to be talking about tonight. And I also want to tell you all that we have another instructor in the classroom with us tonight. His name is Mike Martin. He's a good friend of mine. He's a very awesome paramedic. He works for Acadian down in Jackson County, Mississippi. Um, real, real sharp guy, very good instructor. He's going to be teaching a lot of your classes from here on. And I'm going to let him kind of give a little bit better of an introduction. So Mike, if you want to un unmute and just tell us a little bit about yourself. Hey, what's going on, guys? Hey, I kind of, um, I'm a little new to the online training stuff. I've been, um, brief background, uh, paramedic about 16 years. Uh, I was a U.S. Army combat medic. I've worked offshore, uh, overseas. Uh, I've done some flight medic stuff. Um, I've been a critical care medic since 2007. A lot of IVs and drips and ventilators and stuff like that. Kind of a jack of all trades. I've been teaching uh, American Heart stuff since 2007. I teach TCCC, PHTLS, AMLS, ACLS, PAL, CPR. Um, I love learning, and uh, being an instructor and teaching this stuff kind of keeps me on my toes. Um, as far as being an instructor, I don't like being able to teach something to somebody and not knowing the answers to it, so it keeps me learning constantly and all the time. Um, so I'm new to the online stuff, as you guys can see, I'm kind of old, been doing this for a minute. So the online stuff's fairly newer to me. Uh, it's not hard to figure out, so I think it'll be fine. Tonight's my kind of trial run, so please bear with me. Uh, in the next few classes we do, I'm going to run into some hiccups, so I appreciate y'all bearing with me uh, through this. Uh, anyway, I'm excited. Uh, I'm just kind of getting to the... Um, I looked, I, I come, I'm kind of going through the slides tonight at what we're covering. The next time I teach to you guys, I will have gone over the material in great detail and I will have a lot of additional stuff to add. Um, tonight, I'm kind of just following along with Rob and we're kind of tag teaming this. So I appreciate you guys uh, uh, letting me teach you guys. And hopefully I got a lot of stuff I can, I can show you, a lot of questions I can answer for you. And I want you guys to rest assured that between me and Rob and the rest of the instructor group, you guys are going to murder National Registry. You guys are going to do great. We're going to teach you above and beyond what that book uh, is going to show you. Uh, so I, I hope you're excited. Uh, I think we have a lot of stuff to give you, a lot of knowledge. And I'm glad to be here. So thank you guys. Appreciate it. Absolutely. All right. So it's like you said, tonight we're going to be um, kind of working together on teaching this. He's going to teach half, I'll teach half, and then we're going to also interject. 
and give you guys a good quality class. The thing about it is, is this this lecture is only like 50 slides, 50, 54 slides. It's going to be a very short chapter. And the good thing about that is, is it gives us more time to actually be able to put in experiences and stuff like that. Not war stories. We don't, don't go into that. But there's a lot of experiences and a lot of things that we've seen that we can kind of talk about here. And we'll keep it brief because especially, you know, when we get to things like the actual pediatrics chapter, then we'll get more in depth. And we're going to really start to pull this chapter back. We're going to bring it back from the beginning. That class is one of your last three chapters before we start boot camp. Um, same thing with geriatrics. It's just tonight's going to be an overview about what you can what you can see from an age group perspective. All right. And again, like I said, that's your vital signs are going to be different. And really, their their outlook on the world, their outlook on life. You're going to find that people that might be old enough to say, no, I don't want to go to the hospital or probably their their decision making isn't always the best because their priorities are a little out of whack. Um, and we have to take that into account. So humans develop throughout their lives, as we know that uh, from a medical standpoint, we have newborns and infants, toddlers and preschoolers, school age kids, adolescents being your teenagers. And they're the fun ones when you talk about somebody that's not not making the best decisions. Adolescents are the, they're the cream of the crop for that. And we have three stages of adulthood. Once you get past your adolescence, you have early, middle, and older. And the age groups that fit into that might surprise you. You have to be aware of the physical changes a person undergoes at various stages of life because it may change the way that you, you take care of your patient. <clears throat> so we're gonna start with neonates and infants. Infants are ages one month to one year and they develop fast. Neonates are basically from the minute they pop out to that one month mark. Uh, we are gonna cover that more in depth when we get to the OB chapter, which would be uh, chapter 33, I believe, and that's gonna be uh, way toward the end of the lectures. The leading cause of death in this group is congenital abnormalities and respiratory issues. Um, that's a huge, huge issue with kids and mostly infants. You know, we've heard of SIDS, um, sudden respiratory distress or respiratory failure. These are major issues that can happen. So a lot of times, those are the kind of calls we may go on. They're going to be choking calls or something where they've, they've found something and they wanted to see what it tasted like. So they put it in their mouth and now they can't breathe. So to start off, um, at this age, the younger the person, the faster the pulse rate and the respirations. Now, different textbooks will give you different ranges. Some are set in stone. You know, when we start talking about adults, the adult post pulse range is pretty much set at 6,200, for example. Um, when you start getting into children and infants, different texts don't really agree, but they're all pretty close. Now, for me, for example, I, I always say that a child's heart rate is 100 to 150. I'm sorry, not a child, but like an infant's heart rate, 100 to 150. Those are just even numbers for me to remember easily. If the registry wants you to know that somebody's heart rate is out of range, it's going to get a number that's way out of range so that there's no, there's no confusion based on what book you used when you went to school. Uh, this one says 90 to 180, for example. So if it wants me to know that a child's heart rate is elevated, it'll give me something closer to 200 where no matter what numbers I was looking at or what numbers I memorized, I know that's out of range. Like there's no fudge in that one. That's got to be high. Respiratory rate, 30 to 60. According to this one, I learned 25 to 50. Again, that's just in the right range. If they want me to know something's out of that range, it's going to give me a number that's way out of it. Shortly after birth, your pulse is going to drop a little bit. Um, and the respiratory rate's also going to fall. So as we get older and bigger, we start to move slower. That's our heart and our breathing is going to slow down. Uh, think of it like animals, right? You have the hummingbird that's flapping wings so fast that you can't keep up with them. And you've got the elephant that lives forever, takes forever to do anything, but it's huge. By one year, the respiratory rate slows to 20 to 30 breaths a minute, and your blood pressure will start to climb a little bit. Um, I think that's on the next slide. Yep, there we go. So your blood pressure as an infant is going to be really low. Um, small vessels, small veins, small heart, that kind of thing. It's not really going to be 120 over 80 or anything like you would see as an adult. Usually your systolic blood pressure is around 50 to 70. 
and it's going to climb as their weight climbs. Their blood pressure and their weight are pretty closely tied together. For your weight, uh, neonates usually weigh between six and eight pounds. I know my daughter was six pounds, seven ounces when she was born, and my son was closer to 10. Um, he came out like a linebacker. But so you'll, you'll again, you know, these are rough estimates, usually six to eight, anywhere in there is fine. The head accounts for 25% of the body weight. Um, that's important because if you think about kind of jumping ahead a little bit here for trauma, if a child's climbing up on something and they fall, if there's still a small child, a lot of times they're going to land on their head because the heavier side is going to fall, you know, faster. They're going to wind up falling head first. Um, adults typically, we don't, if we free fall, we're not going to suddenly, we're not going to invert on the way down, but children may. After about two weeks, the infants grow at a rate of about one ounce per day, doubling their weight by four to six months and tripling it by the end of the year. For your cardiovascular system at birth, um, you know, prior to birth, the neonate is using the mom's circulation, everything through the umbilical cord. Once they're born, that cord gets cut. They switch from fetal to independent circulation. For their breathing, infants younger than six months are particularly prone to nasal congestion. So a lot of that, and, and Mike, you can help me out with this, the surfactant that's coming out of their, their airway, it's just their nasal, their noses are so small that it, it just it's very easy to clog up, which normally won't be an issue. Um, Unless a child's, you know, as long as children are being taken care of or whatever, their moms and dads usually clean the nose, that kind of thing. But it does build up a little bit more. The rib cage is less rigid and the ribs sit horizontally. So they sit more flat. They don't curve as much as an adult's ribs do. Ours have, as ours grow, they tend to build a little bit more of a curvature to it. But because their rib cage is smaller, their uh, intercostal muscles aren't developed as much. A lot of times we call the babies belly breathers. Their chest rise isn't quite there because the muscles haven't developed to that point. Um, as we get older, the intercostal muscles around their ribs do start to develop. So, you know, we talk about good breasts for adults. We're looking at equal rise and fall of the chest. For babies, we're not really going to see that. We're going to see the belly doing most of the work. And as long as it looks effortless, that's okay. If you look at a baby that's breathing and they've got, they're forcing the stomach up to the point where the chest is actually collapsing. And then when they breathe out, the chest returns and the stomach goes down and they get the seesaw motion. Um, that would be an example of a problem with their breathing. But just seeing their stomach rise is normally fine. Infants, I'm sorry, infants have proportionally larger tongues and proportionally shorter, narrower airways. You can also pinch them off easily from the back. So we'll talk about this more, but um, you, if you ever have to do like a um, an airway, a manual airway for a child, if you go too far in your head tilt chin lift, you can actually pinch the airway off from the back. So we try not to do that. We put them in a neutral position or a sniffing position, you may hear it called. And that's just so that we don't do that. Um, as they get older, as you start to get more toward adulthood, your airway is firmed up a little bit. That doesn't happen as much, so you can crank the head back. Airway obstruction is really common in infants and older children. Uh, much more common in the younger ages because they're much more um, they're much more curious about what their world is. Not to mention they start to teethe, and when they're teething, they're going to try to chew on everything just because it makes them feel better too. Let's see, I was going to say belly breathers. Yeah. All right, for the nervous system, the nervous system's evolution continues after birth. Now, neonates are born with certain reflexes. I know I always loved the where you put your the palmer reflex so you put like your finger in their hand and they're going to grip it that's a reflex that's not really a conscious choice by them if something touches their palm they're going to grab it that's good and bad it's good if you're checking to make sure they have a reflex um that can be dangerous if what they're grabbing is dangerous because they're going to grab hold of it and then now you got a problem you have the moreau reflex this is where if you take your arms and you spread them um they'll it's going to be like they're uh, hold on a second I'm getting that confused with something else. 
So your Moreau reflex is a startle reflex. That's where if you if you scare them, they flail open. That's what I was trying to say. So it's not the I was thinking of the rebound one, but the Moreau is where like if you kind of clap your hand or something in front of them, they're gonna flail out like they're trying to grab hold of something. You have your sucking reflex. This is where if you stroke the side of a pa of an infant's mouth, a lot of times they're going to start trying to suck on things. That's just so they can get food. Your rooting reflex, um, if you touch their cheek, they'll turn their head in that direction. So any of these, because these are reflexes, if you're trying to check to see if a child is a certain level of consciousness or something, you can check any of these. You may not necessarily have to do the whole inflicting pain or anything like that. And there's also the reflex where if you take your finger and you rub on the bottom of their foot, their foot, they'll they'll kick their foot back. Um, it doesn't cause pain. That's not pain, but it's just a think of it like you, you know, the doctor hits your knee with the little hammer. It doesn't hurt you, but it causes you to kick your foot out. Fontanelles are a pretty good source of when you're of assessment. Um, people who you if you haven't heard of these by name, this is basically the soft spot in the skull. When a child is born, their head's not quite formed like it would normally be formed. It's got to fit through the birth canal, so it, it actually comes out a little squished from the sides. And that is because the skull hasn't completely fused yet. So you have these areas in the skull that are their cartilage, and that's called your fontanelles. They are soft, and as long as a child is healthy and hydrated, the fontanelles should be pretty flat and even with the rest of the bones. But if you look at it and they're bulging, that could be a problem. If they're sunk in, that could be a problem. We'll talk more about that, especially when we get to peds. But um, just be aware that that's there. That is a soft spot. It's a dangerous area to get hit in, obviously, because the bone, the skull doesn't have good protection there. Um, but it's a fantastic assessment tool. If it's, a, if it's depressed, usually it's because they're dehydrated. If it's bulging, it's because of endocranial pressure. It could be trauma-related. It could be... Um, illness related. Um, like I said, we'll talk about that, especially when we start talking about meningitis, for example, that can cause it. Immune systems at this age usually are the moms. They don't lose their mom's immunity for a little while. Infants who can who also receive antibodies by breastfeeding um, because they're getting it from their mom. And this helps their this, this helps their immune system a little bit more. All right, so here's a picture of your fontanelles. As you can see, basically the four lobes of the skull, they're just not fused. So they have that one spot, that interior fontanelle, that's the main one. But even as you can see, like the bones themselves, they're not fused together. So you've got that ridge, it looks like a giant plus sign of cartilage. Psychosocial changes at birth. Um, Everything begins and then they just kind of evolve. As a child grows, they're going to start to see further. They're going to start to recognize people. They're going to start to realize that they don't recognize certain people. So the whole stranger danger thing starts to eventually come into play. Um, but they're also going to start to really react and kind of look around their environment. At this age, mostly what they do is cry. Everything they do is cry because they don't know how to talk to us. So if they're hungry, they're going to cry. If they have a dirty diaper, they're going to cry. If they're in pain, they're definitely going to cry. And normally, parents can tell the difference between what a cry is. If it's a shriek of pain versus the normal cry of a dirty diaper or because your child's hungry, um, even you will be able to tell the difference between that. But a child, but a, a parent will be able to say, no, this isn't a normal cry. That's why I called 911. I don't know what's wrong with my baby. Infants will develop relationships with their parents and caregivers at different rates. So, you know especially if, if a child is not, if they're just not around a parent, say like it's a, a military family and a dad is deployed or a mom's deployed. If they show up a little bit late, sometimes that, that relationship can be a little slow to build. It's not necessarily that it won't happen. It's just child and parent weren't there at the beginning. And sometimes even if they were, the relationship can take a little bit different time. But Bonding or the formation of a close personal relationship is based on a secure attachment. This usually happens when an infant understands that the parent or caregiver is responsible for his or her needs. So if, you know, if only one parent ever feeds the baby or changes the diapers, that kind of thing, that parent will get 
the bonding will happen much faster with that parent. Um, and it's because at this age, your child doesn't have, they don't care about the Xbox. They don't care about those higher levels of comfort and everything. They're really only worried about getting fed, staying warm, getting to sleep, feeling safe, that kind of thing. So the one that provides that, or hopefully both, the parent or the caregivers that provide that are going to be the ones that get that bonded. Anxious or avoided attachment is found in, pa in infants who are repeatedly rejected. Um, and it sucks when you see this. I don't know, Mike, if you've ever come across a child that was dealing with this, but um, if they're dealing with this kind of a patient, if you walk in and they are showing very little emotional response to the parents or the caregivers, um, it usually is a sign that something's been going on. And it could not normally, not necessarily they've been being beaten, but just rejected. Um, a lot of times they'll, the child will kind of revere the parent or the caregiver like a stranger. It's the best way to put it. Maybe just like anybody else, they'll see the parents just like they see you. Yeah, Separate this is going to um, go ahead. This is going to come into play a lot more in the medical legal stuff as far as reporting. I know when we get into um, elderly abuse, pediatric abuse, a lot of this stuff comes into the medical legal stuff. So I'm sure that's a whole different chapter, different ball game. But it's one of the saddest things you're going to see if you stay in this field long enough. Yeah, absolutely. And we talked about um, medical and legal issues and everything, and we didn't really go over. I know that chapter doesn't really talk about or reporting child abuse and stuff like that, but we are going to see that come up through this course about, you know, not just for kids, but for elderly, for regular adults, anybody. If you, as an EMT, if you see something, say something. And not necessarily to the person you don't, don't, I'm not saying, you know, go after the person you think is doing it, but say something to the ER staff, say something to the police or whoever in your jurisdiction you're supposed to report to. Uh, some places will specify that, you know, you have to tell the ER doc or you have to tell the, the, the police or something. It usually is going to wind up being in your protocols, but it is, it's a very sad thing to have to deal with that. Trust and mistrust refers to a stage of development from birth to about 18 months, which involves an infant's needs being met by his or her parents or caregivers. Um, if the baby doesn't see the environment as being secure, they're not gonna really trust anybody. It's, you pretty much have to look out for number one. They learn that at a very early age and it just snowballs as they get older. So for toddlers and preschoolers, Toddlers are ages one to three. This is your, your terrible twos, or, or as mine were, they were a little slow to that game. It was more like terrible threes. Pulse rate is going to start to um, drop down, all right, because they're getting bigger. So pulse rate is normally 90 to 150, according to this. Again, if you, some of y'all have taken EMT classes in the past, your book may have given you different numbers just because different, different publishers will say different things. Respiratory rate is 20 to 30. Uh, at this age, I learned 15 to 30. So 15 and double it. Systolic blood pressure sits around 80 to 100. So it's starting to climb. And their average temperature is going to be 96.8 to 99.6. You have to be specific with that. So understand that when kids get sick or when kids, uh, how do I say this? Um, Children are very, very good at compensating with the weird body temperature. It's not really that uncommon to find out a child's got like 102, 103 temperature and big deal. It's a fever, right? They'll get that when they're teething. Um, if you have an adult that gets 102 or 103 degree temperature, though, their brain's probably melting. So it's, you know, as children, um, their body is just much more receptive to different temperatures. So you have a range here. They're not always going to be locked in. 98.6 or anything of that sort. The toddler's lungs will continue to develop more terminal bronchitis and alveoli, which means that they're going to get better um, oxygenation through their respiration. We talked about the difference between ventilation and oxygenation, or I'm sorry, ventilation and respiration. As the lungs develop, they start to get more of those, those swapping sites at the alveoli, which means they can be more active. They're not going to run out of breath as fast. Preschoolers, ages three to six, pulse rate's gonna continue to drop. So now they're at 80 to 140. Respiratory rate's also gonna drop. Now they're at 20 to 25. Um, systolic blood pressure is 80 to 100. So that is, again, that's continuing to climb. Now, between birth and this age, 
they've been growing very, very fast. But when they reach the three to six years, the weight gain kind of starts to level off. It usually should, unless there's, I mean, it could be because their diet is not quite right, or maybe they have a, a hormonal issue with their endocrine system. But normally, their weight's going to stop progressing at the speed that it has been. They're still going to grow. It's just not, you're not going to see the changes as fast. Although toddlers and preschoolers have more lung tissue, uh, they don't really have well-developed lung mus musculature. So same thing, you're going to notice that you still don't see a whole lot of chest rise and fall. Uh, they're still somewhat belly breathers, not necessarily like they were as kids, but they're just not fully formed. Um, if they wind up in a period of time where they need to have deeper rapid respirations, be it from excessive cardio, like they're running around too much, or um, if something happened, something like a trauma where they hit their head, um, some head injuries will cause you to have certain types of breathing. If they're in this age range, they may not be able to maintain that for very long. So when we talk about shock, which we're going to have a chapter for that, their compensation window is going to be short because they're just they're not able to maintain the breathing rate and stuff like that. And when that starts to fall off, everything just crashes with it. The loss of passive immunity at this point um, is probably the biggest and most obvious development at this stage of life. So they're not going to have their mom's immune system anymore. They're going to be on their own, which means they're going to start to get sick a lot. Uh, colds often develop and it may manifest as GI distress or upper respiratory tract infections where they're just coughing. They may be vomiting. They're going to you're going to start to see that a lot more at this age group. Toddlers acquire immunity as their bodies are exposed to various viruses and germs and you know, as toddlers, unless we're after them about wash your hands and stuff like that, they probably are going to be getting sick a lot and they'll spread it like crazy. You go to school and everybody's like, <sighs> and then they touch somebody and <laughs> like everybody comes home with everything. Um, you just, you do see that a lot at this age near because they have no clue, no inherent knowledge about maybe I should wash my hands. And then what they consider to be washing their hands might just be getting them wet and then drying them off. Neuromuscular growth also makes considerable progress at this age. So toddlers and preschoolers spend time exploring by walking, running, jumping, playing catch, uh, running headfirst into tables that are at eye level with them they don't see. Preschoolers will have a brain that weighs 90% of its final adult weight. Most of your brain is your cerebrum, which is basically your, your memories, um, your cognitive thought, stuff like that. It's not fully developed, but 90% of it is there, which kind of stands to reason when they get to this age, it's always surprising how much they learn and how much they remember and hear when you think they're not. And, you know, you're used to them being younger where they didn't really notice things. But at this point, they'll remember all kinds of stuff because that part of the brain is almost fully, fully there. Uh, and they start putting it to use. Muscle mass and bone density will increase. Physiologically, toddlers have a neuromuscular control capable for bladder control of about 12 to 15 months of age. The child may not be psychologically ready to do uh, potty training until about 18 to 30 months. It's okay. It's not, it's, it's, even if your child's a little slower, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're behind or that there's something wrong. Some just don't, you know, it's always a, like a range to it. There's never, oh, he's 18 months old now. He must be potty trained. It doesn't, doesn't always work that way. The average age of completion for toilet training is 28 months of age. And I we go over this because you're going to get people that call you 911 because their child continues to wet the bed or something like that. You'd be surprised what people call 911 for. So it's important too that you understand this because um, certain illnesses, certain infections may cause incontinence. And, you know, if, if, if parent gets on WebMD and sees incontinence as a, as a symptom for something, they're going to think their kid has cancer or whatever it is that it's telling them. The leading cause of death for this age group is unintentional injuries or accidents. Like I said, you know, they're getting to where they can run. Uh, and I remember when we have a glass table, uh, one of those six seater octagon shaped glass tables. And it's so, if you're looking at it from the side, you really almost, and my daughter was real bad about hauling ass into the into the dining room and just smacking this thing right on the forehead because she didn't see it and um we had to we actually had to take the table and put it away until she got taller 
Um, but you, you'll see a lot of times this is where you start to see those kind of injuries in patients. For your psychosocial changes, toddlers and preschoolers learn to speak and express themselves, which can be pretty comical sometimes. At 36 months of age, basic language is mastered. They don't have an adult, you know, level of language, but they'll know what they're what they want. If they want an apple, they'll tell you they want an apple. Interaction and playing games with other children will begin, and by age 18 to 24 months, uh, cause and effect begin to be understood. So if they do something wrong and they get in trouble. This is about the time where they start to understand that. Children learn to recognize gender differences by observing role models. So they'll look at the parents or preschool teachers, um, older cousins, you know, whatever, whoever they're looking up to, they're going to start to kind of model themselves after that. And they're going to start to figure out the difference between like how, how boys act and how girls act. They're going to, they're going to start to re recognize that stuff at this point. For school age kids, this is ages six to 12 years. So now we're getting into bigger ranges, right? Because our, our growth is starting to slow down as we get closer to adulthood, at least as far as the changes are concerned. Bible signs and body will gradually approach their observed, those that are observed in adulthood. So their pulse and their respiratory rate is going to continue to drop and they're going to get pretty close to those of an adult. So an adult is 60 to 100, which we'll talk about a little bit. The pulse range here, as you can see, 70 to 120 is just a little bit more. Respiratory rate is just a little bit more. 15 to 20, it's 12 to 20 for an adult, so they're almost there. Um, blood pressure is 80 to 110, so now on the upper end of that, you're getting kind of close to that adult blood pressure as they get older. This is a span of six years, so it's, it's you know, that's why the ranges are as wide as they are. Obvious physical traits and body function changes become apparent. Um, they're going to grow about four pounds a year, two and a half inches or so. Permanent teeth are going to come in. So in this age group, especially early on, they're going to start losing their, their baby teeth. Brain activity increases in both hemispheres. And unintentional injuries are the leading cause of death in this group. So same thing. You know, they just, they'll, it's not like they're having hold my beer moments like teenagers will. It's just, they're not paying attention at the top of the stairs. Um, or they'll try to eat something and not pay attention and they'll choke on it and that sort of thing. For your psychosocial changes, children will learn various types of reasoning. So you have pre-conventional. This is where children act almost purely to avoid punishment and get what they want. I'm going to foot stomp that one for you because you'll probably see that on a test. They just worry about, I don't want to get a whipping, so I'm not going to do this. Conventional reasoning. Uh, this is where children look for approval from their peers in society. That is going to become more apparent as they get closer to teenage years. Post-conventional reasoning. Children make decisions guided by their conscience. Again, we're talking about as they get older. Starting off, the pre-conventional is usually what you're going to see. Children begin to develop their own self-concept and self-esteem, which is great. The only problem is sometimes they develop it so soon that they're still in that awkward stage and then they it winds up hurting them a little bit for their self-esteem, but they they do start to develop it here. Um, they'll have their self-concept, which is how they see themselves, and they're also their self-esteem is how they feel about themselves. They're two different things. Adolescence, um, this is pretty much from puberty on up. So any adolescent, or I'm sorry, in adolescence, which is 12 to 18 years. If you want the actual numbers, vital signs begin to level off within the adult ranges. At this point, when they have a when their age is a teen, like 13, 14, especially getting closer to 18, their vitals are they pretty much match. Like if you if you show up to treat somebody that's 15, 16 years old, um, they're not an adult per se, but they're gonna be one physiologically. Your their their pulse range should be in the same range as somebody that's 25 years old. Their their respiration should be in the same range. Blood pressure might be a little bit lower, depending on the on the body size, but like I said, it's because it's tied to weight. Um your systolic blood pressure is between 90 and 110, not 100, sorry, 90 and 110. And your respiration and pulse range are the adult numbers. So 60 to 100 beats a minute is your pulse, 12 to 20 is your respirations. Go ahead and get those numbers locked in because I've not seen any textbook say any different on those. Usually it's the kids that get the ranges, get the uh, the different numbers. 
adolescents experience a two to three year growth spurt, uh, an increase in muscle mass and bone density as the body changes. And you'll see this very, very apparent in boys. Um, they'll go to bed one night looking like a six year old, wake up looking like a 22 year old. Growth begins with the hands and feet. So you, you can kind of see it coming. If, um, if suddenly none of their shoes and they've got big hands and feet, you can kind of tell, all right, it's this growth spurt's coming. Um, that moves to the long bones after that. You may get where, uh, I, don't, I don't think anybody's ever called 911 for this, at least not in my experience, but um, the growing pains where a child might be like, you know, my their joints start to hurt because they're growing. Depending on how they explain that to their parents, their parents may take it the wrong way and, and call 911. So you could see that, but um, sometimes that'll happen. They'll just, ow, you know, my elbow hurts or my knee hurts real bad. Uh, and it really is not anything wrong. It's not like they had an accident. They just growing pains. You're going to find that in this age group. All right. Also at this age, again, because this is where puberty happens. So their reproductive system matures. Secondary sexual development takes place. They're going to get hair in funny places and their voices are going to start changing octaves mid-sentence. Um, the external sex organs will enlarge, pubic hair forms, all that stuff. In girls, there's breast development, menstruation begins, and it's all over the place. It, there's no, it's not like uh, 20 to 30 year olds where it, it's, you know, on the dot, you can, you can base your calendar off of it. Um, early on, it, it may be, it could be a weak variance in there. So that being said, how do we know, like if we show up to somebody that's got a, a stomach pain and it's a girl and she's. I don't know, 15 years old. Um, how do we know if the fact that she's late is because she's pregnant or not? Do we even know? Anybody still with us? <laughs> yeah. There we go. All right, yes. So. Okay. So yes, mine keep on getting I keep getting kicked out, but I'm here. Yes, I'm I'm still here. Yeah, mine's too. Okay. I don't know what's going on with network connections, but the question the question I'm posing is if you have a 15 year old girl complaining of stomach pains, um, and knowing that early on, like close to puberty their menstrual cycle is usually not regular at all. Like it can be a week or two variance in when, in when it starts. It's not always on the same same day, same week, that kind of thing. How do we know if, if they're late because they're pregnant or not? Is that even possible? It's like, do we know? We not don't know. Right off the bat. No, not without a test, right? And we that's not our job in the field. We don't we don't administer those at all. So you'll hear it said a lot. All women that are able to be pregnant, if they're capable, they are pregnant until proven otherwise. Um, because it's just it's in, almost impossible to know for sure, right? That's we don't have the ability to test for that, nor would I ever want to. Um <laughs> but we just we just basically assume that they might be, we'll make our treatment decisions as though they might be. And we'll take them to the hospital because if it is something that's wrong, let's say that they do have an ectopic pregnancy and we'll learn all about that in the right chapter. Uh, that's a life threat. So you don't want to go in with the, the knowledge of, oh, you know, you may just be because you're 15 years old and there's no real set schedule. You know, don't get that in your head. Try to try to keep that pregnant until proven otherwise, just in case. Hey, Rob. Yes. Hey man, one thing I wanted to add is uh, most of the time, uh, as many years as I've been on the ambulance, this is not one of those questions you're going to ask a teenage female in front of her family and get a honest answer on. This is one of those things that um, you kind of got to handle with kid gloves and then route to the hospital, maybe bring that up and uh, see if you can get an honest answer. But yeah, this this is not going to be an honest thing that's going to happen on the scene. Yeah, exactly. Because you ask a girl if she's pregnant and her parents are standing around, I can pretty much put money on what the answer is going to be. Uh, no. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, nah, yeah, I'm pregnant. No, you ain't going to see that happen. 
Um, if it does, I mean, it's because they're they're trying to get a rise out of their parents or something, but that's really, really rare. Um, yeah, get them in the back of the truck on the way to the hospital when it's just you and her and you're doing your, your secondary assessment or whatever. Then you can ask for like, you know, hey, didn't want to ask this in the house because I know your parents are there and I'm not going to judge. I'm not going to say anything, but is there any chance you might be pregnant? That way, they're, they may still lie, but you have the better chance of getting the honest answer. Psychosocial changes. Um, adolescents and their families often deal with conflict as adolescents try to gain control of their lives from their parents. Uh, when they get further into their teenage years, they really start to pull away from how it's always been, where their parents controlled everything. So they want their privacy. Um, they're very self-conscious. They're always looking in the mirror at themselves and comparing themselves to the Victoria's Secret models or the people at school or whatever. Adolescents may struggle to create their own identity, and it could change drastically depending on what day of the week it is. They often want to be treated like adults, yet cared for like children. So, um, and, and that that sometimes causes a lot of strife. They want all the they want all their freedoms, but they still want, like you know, they want their own food. They want the food to be cooked for them. They don't want to do their own laundry and, and all those different things. Antisocial behavior and peer pressure tend to peak around 14 to 16 years. Um, they are much more likely to try things like smoking, illicit drug use, unprotected sex. A lot of that stuff happens in this age range because they are they realize that they can finally start to kind of try all these things. They want to try them, but they don't really think about the consequences so much. So things like condoms are not, they, a lot of times they're like, I don't worry about it or whatever. Um, eating disorders can arise in adolescents from an attempt to gain self-control what they eat. So if they feel like they can't control anything else in their lives, a lot of times what they do with their food is that's there is them trying to gain control. Uh, sometimes they will cut. There's, there's a term out there called cutters where they'll they'll cut their forearms or they'll cut their thighs or something like that. Um, they see that in the field. Adolescents may show a greater interest in sexual relations. So a code of personal ethics develops, which is great, uh, based par partly on the parents' ethics and values and partly on the influence of their environment. So they kind of wind up somewhere in between. You'll have people that will have, they'll still hold their parents' values, but because they hang out with a certain crowd, they'll, they'll adopt that as well. A lot of times just so that they'll continue to fit in. Many adolescents are fixated on their public image and are terrified of being embarrassed. And I'll take that a step further. Um, we had a, I don't do a lot of war stories, but I'm going to mention this one because it, it directly relates. We had a motor vehicle accident, and this girl, there was like a 16-year-old uh, girl driving it. And it was it was bad. She was awake, but we were not entirely sure she was going to make it. You, know, you can't say that to your patient, right? But I'm, I'm over there. I'm trying to, trying to get her out of the vehicle, for one thing, uh, so we can at least get her into the back of the ambulance. And she's awake to talk to me. And you would think that somebody in that situation where they might not live would be concerned about that, right? Like, oh my God, I'm not going to die. Am I please don't let me die? That kind of thing. That's what I was expecting to hear. What I actually heard was, is my face messed up? Like that was, that was what her concern was. Um, and that's, that's not, that wasn't specific to her. That was, that's adolescence, right? They, they care so much about how they look, how they're perceived, what their friends think and stuff like that. Like she, the, the fact that she might die never played into it. And it really wasn't, I said, yeah, all right. So some of it might've been vanity, but um, it's also the fact that kids in that age range, their mortality is just not, they don't think about it. It's not something that factors in. As we get older, we start to realize, hey, you know, um, I might not walk away from that. So I'm not gonna do it. But um, teenagers, children, they really don't have that. and. So because of that, their priorities are different. Um, they're not really worried about mortality and death. They're more worried about how people are going to see them in school. Or, and it, like I said, it, like it's not necessarily that they might be worried about not being the popular one. It might be that they just, they're going to drop from where they are. You show up with a big scar on your face. Oh my God, nobody's going to want to look at me and talk to me. And that's the end of the world to them. That is, that is death to them. They'd rather, they'd actually rather real death than that. So it's it's a, it's an awkward 
weird situation, but sometimes you'll see that. So a lot of times, if you can keep that in mind, if you're wanting to reassure somebody that's 16, 17 years old, um, that might be the way to go. If you can help reassure them that, you know, hopefully that won't leave too bad of a scar or no, nobody's going to miss that finger. You got nine more, you know, that kind of thing. Adolescents are at a higher risk than other populations for suicide and depression. And that seems to be more and more true by the day. Um, my daughter's 16, my son's 10, and it seems like everybody they know tosses the idea of suicide around like they're tossing around what they want to eat for dinner. Um, and some of it's just talk, but I know that a lot of it, like suicide is on the rise. So there, that's, and I don't have an answer for that one. I don't know what would make it better. Just it's, you're going to probably run into that in your career. All right. So with that. Um, we almost made it an hour. We're going to take a 10 minute break, be back at five minutes till, and um, Mike is going to take over teaching with early adults. Hey Mike, we're on the twenty fourth slide. I handed you presenter so that you can um, you can pull up the slideshow on your end and control it. Okay, I'm here. I couldn't hit the uh, screen for whatever reason. <laughs> All right. Like I said, now's the, the best time to get the uh, the tech issues out of the way. We're both here. So. <laughs> All right. Give me uh give me like five minutes. Let me, a, a buddy of mine is needs a Sam splint. I don't know what's going on with this kid, but uh, hopefully they didn't break their leg. Let me run out in my garage and see if I can find him a Sam splint. He's walking down here now. Give me just a few minutes and I'll pack back on here. Okay. No problem. No problem. They're on the board. All right.
Okay, all right, so um, your module test technically is going to be due tomorrow night, um, just because this is the last chapter of module one. That being said, I know that because it's the first module, almost everybody's trying to get situated and understand how things work. So, you need an extension. 
I can give you a couple of days, but uh, hopefully I've seen, I can see that you've at least taken a couple of tests, that kind of thing. So this module is not a long one. That's why the module test is already on us. But when, like I said, module two is going to be pretty quick. Module three is going to take forever because you know, it's medical. Four will take a little while, and then five will go by before you know it, and we're, we're done with the class. Um, so if you need that extra time, just let me know. Hey, Mr. Robert, somebody's mic was on while you were talking. Could you repeat that? I'm sorry. Yeah, I was just saying that technically your module test is due tomorrow night. Um, and, and all of the chapters up until now as well, because this is the last chapter of module one. But because it's, it's module one, this is the beginning of the class. I know that people are still trying to get used to how things work. So I'm pretty liberal with due dates in the beginning. If you need an extension, I can give you a couple days, but not too long because I don't want you to, the whole point is so that you don't fall behind the class. So I can give you a couple days, but I don't want to, I want you to think that you've got a month to catch up, what, three, four, two tests, something like that. That's all. Oh, okay, thank you. No problem. Are you back, Mike? <clears throat> Hey, what's up, guys? There you I go. am here. All right. So do you want to share the slides on your end, or do you want me to control them? Um, like I said, man, this I'm brand new to this. So if you want to go ahead and maintain control of the slides, and, you know, I'll I'll talk. Like I said, uh, hey, guys, sorry. <laughs> I, um, I have not looked at a lot of this stuff. I've... I've taught it before. I have not prepared tonight, um, so I'm going to ask Robert to chime in and, and do a lot of uh, add a lot of input uh, to kind of help out. I'm just kind of getting my feelers out there to figure out um, kind of where we're at. Uh, the next time I teach you guys, I will have gone over a lot of the material and added some stuff to it, my own little flair. But for now, I'm going to ask Robert to kind of maintain uh, leadership. But I will certainly uh, go through the slides with you guys and make sure you know what's going on with it. Okay, so that being said, everybody's still see the slideshow. Can everybody see the slideshow? I can see it. You can see it, okay. All right, we should be good then. All right, so I'm not a... Uh... I don't want to stare at my ugly mug all night, so I'm going to go ahead and cut my camera off. But I do um, I do ask you guys to chime in, ask questions, talk. Uh, I was going to – there's a lot of things I was going to say. I was going to ask how many of y'all had kids, um, how old were your kids, you know, chime in with their ages and kind of see where everybody – this is what we're talking about, lifespan development. If you guys have a six-year-old, um, then you're intimately aware of exactly what we're talking about and your kids' bottle signs and their weight, um, what they eat, their habits, and stuff like that. So. Um, be active, guys. Chime in. Um, I know in these online classes, it's real easy to get comfortable and lay back and just stare at the screen and kind of mundanely, you know, um, listen, just kind of like you're watching TV. Um, but I'd really, I think you guys will get a lot more out of it if everybody's interactive and chimes in and kind of talks. And please, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you chime in, take off your audio, and let's chat. I think you're going to get a lot more out of the class. Somebody's got an 18-year-old. Okay, so we got – so age groups, man. See, so who's the youngest person in here? We got somebody that's, uh, what, 17, 18, 19, something like that? I'm 18. I'm 18. I'm 18. I'm 18. All right, so older people, people that have been in another job for 10, 15, 20 years, and you're swapping. Okay, 33? Well, uh, I've been in EMS for 19 years. Okay, so you ain't new. No. I like it. Well, I tell you what, man, one of the cool things about this type of forum is you can certainly chime in and add your experience. Now, we obviously, you know, we try to we try to pipe down on the war stories and stuff. But if you got something pertinent, you know, leave a leave a little chime on the bottom there and uh, certainly pipe in because everybody with experience in this field has something to add to this training and education. OK, so we got 
EMT dispatcher. Okay. We got a lot of experience in this group. So this isn't a bunch of kids out of high school. And yeah, we got CNAs that have been doing this for a while. They've been doing patient care. So cool. I like it. DNA. A lot of CNAs. So cool. So you guys have seen uh, the span of children, because a lot of you have children, a lot of you deal with elderly as being CNAs and EMTs and dispatchers. Um, and that's something for the rest of the group to know. Look look at who your classmates are. If you need to reach out to somebody and and ask for some help. Okay, so round two for a lot of people. I like it. All right, so early adults. Um, I have a 17 and a 19 year old and a 10 year old. So my girls, my 17 and 19 year old, my 19 year old is in college right now. So I'm dealing with this 19 to 40 year old uh, for the first time. Um, and she knows everything. And we have a, another young man that lives here with me that also knows everything. Um, at that age, they're, they're a different breed. So um, vital signs, at this point in time, these vital signs are gonna be adult-esque, right? So like Rob said, typically past like 15, 16, um, the vital signs for young adults don't really vary until you hit elderly. The elderly population is gonna have, they're gonna be on blood thinners, and blood pressure medicines, they're gonna be on a lot of stuff that's gonna regulate their vital signs. But these people from 19 to 40 are typically young, healthy people that don't take medications to auto-regulate stuff, their heart rate, blood pressure, things like that, most of the time, most of the population. So heart rate, heart rate's between 60 and 100. Uh, respiration's 12 to 20. That number, pound that number into your head, 12 to 20. If you take pre-hospital trauma life support, any, any of the NAEMT courses, which, Okay, so we got some law enforcement guys in here, cool. Um, which a lot of that goes hand in hand. Um, sorry guys, I'm reading the comments too. So I'm not, uh, I bounce around. I'm trying not to be a mundane uh, born instructor, which I hope you all appreciate. I'm gonna bounce around, I'm gonna ask questions. Um, I'm gonna pick random names and ask y'all stuff. So Mr. Hawkins, firefighter, cool. So you've probably seen a few things in your time. Um, so anyway, cool. This is what I like. I like the interaction, guys. I like y'all chiming in. I like to see that y'all are interactive and you're paying attention. Uh, it's, uh oh, where'd Bessie go? Um, anyway, it's so easy just to sit back and listen to this stuff and pick up about 20% of it to, to retain for a test. So the more active we are, I think the better as a group. Um, anyway, respiration is 12 to 20. That is, um, <laughs> didn't want to be called on now. Okay, nutritionist. Hey, I might have to get with you later get my blood pressure checked. Um, anyway, got a lot of really uh, pretty wide a group of people in the group, which is cool. Really, really cool. Thank you. I'm gonna. Um, <laughs> was that? Yeah. I need to reach out to you after class. Sorry, I had to get that. In. All right. So anyway, um, the systolic blood pressure, 80 to 120 is normal. Uh, as you're a little bit younger, depending on. Um, you know, your body size and type before you hit, you know, the mid twenties, it may be a little lower. So the range is a little broader in this age group, um, but 12 to 20 in respiration, that's pretty much ballpark. Uh, any EMS protocol, if you're like with the KD Enamel Service, AMR, um, 12 to 20 is normal. Um, anyway, your body at this age group, this is a military age group. I know Rob's in the military. I've been in the military. This is the prime peak years of your life. Um, when your body, functions at the optimal level. Um, your lifelong habits are solidified, as it says. This is when you're gonna start picking up traits and, um, and, and things for the rest of your life. Um, so this is when people start to have children, you know, 18, 19, 20. This is when you go to college and figure out what career you're gonna have the rest of your life. This is when you have children. Your psychosocial changes. Um, and of course, your, your life goals all start to come into play at this point. Um, marriage, family. Um, it says here one of the more stable periods of your life, um, which man, <laughs> I struggled when I was young. Hopefully it's more stable for you guys than it was me. Um, but early adulthood is a, uh, this age is a hard age to figure out because for the first time in your life, you're having to do you and take care of somebody else besides yourself. So it's uh, it's a huge part of most people's lives. Um, 41 to 60, man. Hey, I'll, I'll be honest, guys. I just hit 40. Um, kind of sucks. I miss being young and uh, getting out of bed and not hurting every day. Um, but well, I'm 41. 
Okay, so you know the feeling, man. Um, bottle signs are still the same, man, 60 to 100. Usually after you hit, um, you know, 20, 18 to 20, your bottle signs don't change a whole lot until you hit an age old enough to where you're taking medications to really auto-regulate stuff and change things. Um, 60 to 100, you know, that's normal bottle signs. Um, you're the vast majority of your population of patients, if you're an EMS, is this, exactly what you're looking at on screen. 60 to 100. If somebody's heart rate is in the 30s and 40s, you got to fix that. If it's 160, 180, you got to fix that. Like Rob was talking about earlier, the stuff you're going to learn in this book and the stuff you're going to learn for National Registry, you're going to you're going to know the norms. You're going to know what's normal that you run into every day. And that way, eventually, finally, when you see somebody with a heart rate in 180, they're pale, they're diaphoretic, they're passing out. That's abnormal. We need to we need to immediately fix that emergently. Um, so these vital signs, pound them in your head, man. Um, no matter if you take AMLS, PHTLS, ACLS, PAL, CPR, these things are normal. See, I'm, I'm sure all you guys have taken CPR, right? Somebody up a truck? What y'all doing? Okay, I don't know what that noise is, but. Um, oh, that work. Somebody's, somebody's um, unmuted. I'm fixing it. There we go. All right. All right. So um, anyway, 12 to 20 respirations. This is stuff like with an EMS protocols that these norms right here is when we have to act. EMS protocols, um, anything below 60, anything above 100, any respirations below. Y'all ever heard the term less than eight intubate? If somebody's not breathing at least eight times a minute, their respirations are not stable. So that's when we have to act. Uh, it's a duty to act on our part. And the systolic pressure at 90 to 140, that's variable. If you have a 90 pound female, her normal pressure may be uh, 90 over 70. So just know that a lot of this stuff is variable, but that's the norms. Just know the norms and when you see the abnormal, you'll know when you have to act. Um, middle adults, hearing loss. Um, I have selective hearing loss when my fiance yells at me. Um, but there is some normal hearing loss as you get older with age. Um, as far as cancer and stuff like that, uh, when you hit the 40s and 50s, that's when you're typically going to have to go start getting cancer. Um, <laughs> when you're going to have to start getting cancer checks and stuff like that, um, you know, colon cancer and stuff like that. I'm not super excited uh, about the day I have to go get checked for that. Uh, but as you get older, you have to start checking for those things. Menoper, men, menopers, menopause occurs in your late 40s and 50s. Um, a lot of things change at this point. Um, a lot of females, as far as 40s and 50s during menopause, obviously, you got to think about childbirth and uh, or the lack thereof at that point. Diabetes, hypertension, weight problems. Uh, you don't have the testosterone and estrogen and stuff like that you had when you were younger. You're not able to really maintain the body weight and, and the kind of partying and hanging out that you used to. Hangovers suck way worse uh, in your 40s and 50s, as a lot of you, some of you guys may know. Um, and of course, at this point in time, you have kids and grandkids and kids in college and um you know having the free time to go to a gym and eat healthy and diet um especially if you guys plan on being an ems for more than about five minutes a healthy diet's um you really have to you really have to try hard to not eat at a drive through in an ambulance often uh, it's one of those things especially later in life that uh, catches up to you um psychosocial so achieving life goals um it's been 20 years, man. I'm looking to go back to nursing school and stuff. There's certain things I'm looking at that I hadn't looked at forever because I've been in kind of a, you know, just riding the uh, the slump of life. But as you get older, middle adults, you start looking at things you haven't done. So you look back and you start to kind of catch up on those things. Um, me and my daughter are actually going to be going to nursing school together, which is kind of cool. Um, but like I said, it's been a long time. It's one of those things I'm just looking at. And a lot of older adults do that. Um, readjust uh, lifestyles as children leave home. Um, Ours are right at that point uh, where they're about to uh, embark on their own journey and kind of figure their stuff out. And this is when um, a lot of things change for you as adults. Uh, physical, emotional, and spiritual reserves to handle life's issues. You didn't have that when you were younger. I think right now handling like the death of a parent, there's a lot of things that we handle as older people that we have the capability um, to either comfort others, take care of ourselves, and help others, which we didn't have as younger people. Um, and that's something you guys need to understand as you encounter death and stuff like that on scenes. There's going to be people that can handle it, 
uh, the person you go to to get um, demographic information needs to be the, the oldest, most mature, most uh, well put together person on the scene because you're going to run into everybody that's going to be emotionally not able to handle that situation. So it's going to be the older people in their 30s and 40s and 50s. Um, and of course, you're going to have people taking care of people in college and their aging parents, people that have parents with Alzheimer's, dementia, things of that nature to where you're the caregiver for both the young and the old. Uh, this is one of the busiest parts in your life where you got to put everybody above yourself. So, All right. The elderly. This is an interesting population. These guys crack me up. I'll be honest with you. Um, 61 years and older. Um, there's a lot of things in life that don't matter as much at that age that, that we worry about as younger people. Um, your life expectancy is changing. You have uh, illness, cancer, diabetes, people lose limbs. Um, you know, they, they used to be able to get around on their own and go golfing and, and go hang out with their friends. <laughs> yeah, golfing bingo, gotcha. Um, things change at this point in life. Um, what you do on the weekends change, what you, what does that say? Now approximately 78 years, okay. So um, yeah, a lot of things in life change at this point. Um, is anybody in their 60s? I'm just curious. Yeah, Victoria, I agree with you. They don't, they do not give, uh, of course I can't curse online, but they don't, yeah. It, there's certain things at that point in life that they have agreed to let go to not bother them. And uh, hopefully I get to that level here one day. We'll see. Um, so like I said earlier, I hit on this. Vital signs depend on the patient's health, medical condition, medication. Medication is really, really coming to play in the elderly because um, your body's normal compensatory mechanisms like adrenaline that ups your heart rate. Uh, uh, anyway, adrenaline ups your heart rate, your blood pressure, stuff like that. If you have hypertension, your, your doctor's going to put you on lisinopril and hydrochlorothiazide and certain medications that drop it. Um, so it's at times when your body needs to perfuse, like on its own, it's not going to because you're taking a medication that's going to prevent your body from perfusing higher. You're taking a medication to stop that and to prevent that. A lot of elderly patients, um, and y'all, y'all may know this on your own. A lot of elderly patients, if you ask for their medications, they're going to hand you a damn shoebox with 60 bottles in it. Um, a lot of it's going to be polypharmacy stuff. You're going to have a patient that has a foot doctor an orthopedic doctor, and they're all going to be on different narcotics, right? So um, you may have an ultra mental status patient that's on multiple things and they don't know. They're not a pharmacist. They just do what their doctor tells them. So you're going to run into patient with multiple medications um, that change physiologically how their body functions. Um, their body doesn't use the normal compensatory mechanisms for trauma. You're going to have an elderly patient, trauma patient that's going to hit the steering wheel and they're not going to compensate like me or you would at our age because they're gonna have medications to prevent that. That's something you gotta take into account. When you're going to get a refusal on that old guy, know that he might not be compensating like normal. Um, your cardiovascular system in elderly, um, arthrosclerosis, you're gonna have plaque and hardening in the, uh, in the arteries. Um, this is gonna get worse over time. And you guys know if, if that plaque builds up and that plaque breaks off, it, it goes around and forms a clot and causes strokes and heart attacks and stuff like that. Um, heart rate and cardiac output decrease. You know, of course, over time, I don't know, I don't know how far, how in depth you guys are in anatomy and physiology. I'm not sure the requirements prior to this program, but um, as you get older, your cardiac system, your Purkinje fibers, they they calcify, and that's when you start getting arrhythmias and first, second, third degree heart blocks, and that's what causes people to get pacemakers. As you get older, this stuff happens physiologically to your heart. Um, your vascular system doesn't compensate because typically, remember, your arteries, you have arteries and veins that have tunica intima, tunica media. You have muscles in there that contract, get bigger and smaller um, based off the situation. If you're, if you're scared, if you're in a fight, your veins and arteries change sizes. They compensate. Your heart rate goes up. Your blood pressure goes up. Your pupils get bigger. Uh, you can see better. This is your parasympathetic and, and sympathetic nervous system going back and forth in a tug of war. As you get older, this doesn't happen as well. It doesn't compensate. Your vascular system becomes stiff. You don't have the peripheral vascular resistance um, to change your heart rate and blood pressure that you used to at this age, 60s, 70s, 80s. 
Um, so replace blood cells that declines to uh, your osteocytes and your femurs and your, your long bones and stuff that would create blood, you know, blood uh, cells. You lose the ability to compensate and to help yourself. So that's why these people stay in ICU for days and days and they can't just get into a, a bad wreck and get out in a couple of days and heal in a few weeks. Uh, it takes a lot longer. All right. Um, your respiratory. Um, of course, as you, I'm not telling you guys nothing you don't know. As you get older, especially people that smoked in the 70s and 80s and 90s, um, you know, the size of your airway and your respiratory system as you get older, it does increase. Um, your surface area decreases. Um, this is when like CPAP and PEEP and a lot of other uh, vent settings change as you get older that you don't have when you're, when you're younger. Um, your elasticity, if you have somebody with, if you guys know what COPD is, emphysema, COPD, asthma, um, this is the lung's ability to stretch um, and compensate. So if somebody has chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder and their lungs can't stretch and compensate like they used to, um, that's basically what happens to your elasticity. That's why people need to sleep with CPAP and BiPAP. Um, intercostal muscles, you don't have the musculature. Um, okay, so we got some people that have family that sleep on BiPAP and CPAP. You see it every day. You see people that smoked for 40 years and back in the day that was cool. Um, and now they're paying for it. Uh, and especially now that they're older, they have these disease processes and they, they cannot compensate like they used to. Um, the muscles you have can't compensate for your breathing. So people need machines. Um, breathing is more labor intensive and people, kids can't really compensate. I know Rob had it on earlier. Kids can't compensate because uh, they don't have the uh, musculature to compensate as long. Adults can compensate for a long time, but they also, um, they also quit on you as well. I've had a lot of people breathe the best they can until they see EMS and they literally just stop breathing and go into respiratory arrest on our arrival. Um, so yeah, compensation, man, as you get older, it goes away. All right, next. Okay, aspiration and obstruction become more likely. Um, how many of you guys, I know there's a lot of CNAs in here, so you've been in nursing homes, right? So you've seen patients that because of a stroke, they lose um, muscle tone, they lose the ability because of certain nerves like your your, your cranial nerves, they lose the ability to swallow on half their mouth. You have to have egg tubes, feeding tubes, because you lose the ability to really chew and swallow like you used to. That's these patients that um, they can't eat, they can't swallow, they aspirate stuff into the lungs, they get pneumonia. Um, and to the elderly, it ends up being, they, they can't cough that stuff out. They don't have the musculature like we just talked about to get that stuff out. Um, their, their lung capacity is 50% of what it used to be at, at 75, 80, 85. Does anybody have a grandparent or a parent that's like 80, 90, 95, like really elderly? Because um, these people are really, really high risk for this. Um, okay, 75, got you. All right, so you lose muscle mass, respiratory muscle mass. As you get older, of course, um, all your muscle mass everywhere decreases, but um, your ability to compensate and use your intercostal muscles and your uh, your stomach muscles to compensate for your breathing goes away. Not completely away. It diminishes extremely. Okay. So somebody just said that their dad has aspiration often or a lot. Um, that's scary. That can, uh, that can kill you uh, very quickly. Um, stiffness of the thoracic cage. What kind of stuff happens as you get older to your bones, guys? Osteoporosis, brittle bone disease. Your bones don't have the ability to regenerate like they used to. Uh, they get brittle, um, they break. I don't know how many of you guys, I can't tell you how many times I've done CPR on somebody and y'all break every bone in their chest um, because the osteoporosis, brittle bones, they all snap, the cartilage pops off their chest. Um, and then of course, decreased surface area available for gas exchange. Your alveoli have to be wide open to exchange gas. And as you get older, Excuse me. As you get older, um, you lose the ability to for this stretch to happen. Um, so gas exchange is a lot harder. Uh, I was I had four new employees today at Acadian, and one of the things they'd never even seen or heard of was like CPAP and PEEP. This is positive end expiratory pressure um, and continuous airway pressure. These are things that older adults have to have to maintain the stretching of their alveoli to to exchange gases that people younger you know. 20s, 30s, 40s don't have to have that. 
Um, but as you get older, you have to have something to help you compensate for that stretch to keep you having so you can breathe. Um, anyway, let me see. Like I said, guys, sorry. I, I wish I would have gone over this stuff ahead of time. I'm just kind of going off the cuff here. Okay, so endocrine system. Um, so you guys all know uh, your pancreas is what produces insulin. A lot of your organs start to break down over time as you get older. Um, liver, kidneys, lungs, um, a lot of things are less effective as you get older. You see people on dialysis, you see people on breathing machines, uh, your endocrine system. Uh, so what happens when insulin drops off? Somebody chime in with an answer here. What happens when your insulin does not work effectively? What disease process is that called? Hyperglycemia, hyper, hyper. One, two. It's diabetes, diabetes, right? Um. Anyway, your metabolism decreases. Um. Uh, people slow down their physical activity. Um, they don't increase, decrease their food intake. So what happens? What happens if your physical activity drops off, but your food intake does not? What if you're eating butterfingers every day, but you're not walking around? Wait. Yeah, you get a little, you get a little white. Y'all can't see it. I'm gonna act like I'm skinny, but I'm not. Uh, as I get older, I tend to lose, uh, gain a little weight myself. Um, reproductive system changes to some extent. Um, <laughs> they make medications for that, right? Because people, that stuff does not work as well as it used to in your younger years. Um, everything slows down and gets a little less effective as you get older. So, um. Also, I guess to hit on that, I'm sure, I don't know how much pharmacology is in this class. Um, reproductive system changes, that's one of those things. Also, just like pregnancy, you're not gonna get a, um, a, a honest, reliable answer when you ask somebody before you give them nitroglycerin for their chest pain. If they're on something called a PDE5 inhibitor, a PDE5 inhibitor is Cialis, Viagra, medications such as that, then you don't have to have erectile dysfunction to be on those medications. You can have congestive heart failure and be in a CHF clinic and be on a PDE5 inhibitor. Sometimes when you ask somebody that, they may not know what a PDE5 inhibitor is, but a lot of times you will not get a solid answer on scene. Where this comes into play, if you're about to give oxygen, aspirin, nitro for somebody with chest pain, an older guy, maybe in his 50s, 60s, um, that's having chest pain, um, sometimes, depending on my spidey sense, I wait till I get out to the amp. I put them on oxygen. I do a 12 lead. I wait till I get outside and say, hey, dude, hey, I know your family was in front of us on scene. I didn't want to ask you, are you taking Cialis, Viagra, or something like that? And sometimes, you know, not all the time. Sometimes they'll tell me, yep, I am. I just didn't want to say it in front of the police and my neighbors that came by worried about me. Um, one of those things you got to consider in EMS um, is certain answers you're going to get to medications when you take a head to toe history. Uh, something you got to think about. Anyway, I'm trying not to get off on a tangent, but I think that's kind of important. Um, all right. So men still are able to produce sperm, uh, but of course, rigidity over time does uh, sometimes require medication use and whatnot. Um, <laughs> I wasn't ready. <laughs> I wasn't ready for the slide. So, <laughs> Women have a decrease in the size of the uterus and stuff like that. So things do change over time. Hormone production um, <laughs> for both sexes gradually decreases. Over time, people, um, and they tend to lose interest in certain things and uh, take up interest in other things as they get older, 60s, 70s, and 80s. Um, some people are worried about breaking a hip, which is a pretty big concern at that point. Uh, sexual desires may diminish. It doesn't cease. I don't know. I'm not speaking from experience most likely uh, is, doesn't go away, but the ability um, does. Your, your ability to, uh, to take care of this goes away over time. So. I had the will, just not the means. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, the will's there. The means sometimes leaves. Um, ah, cool. So digestive system. Man, if y'all worked in a nursing home, y'all know what I'm talking about. Digestive system. So taste cessation decreases, saliva decreases. Sometimes these people aren't able to chew, swallow food, uh, and digest it as well as they used to. Um, you'll see people with colostomy bags and diapers, um, people that need peg tubes because they cannot eat as well as they used to, especially after a stroke where you have some kind of cranial nerve issue. 
and you have a problem chewing and uh, along top of the saliva decretion. Um, and then the taste is say, taste sensation. Of course, if you guys, if any of y'all have had COVID or had family with it, you know that if something doesn't taste as good as it used to, you're not going to eat the same stuff you used to. A lot of these people that used to love all kinds of stuff when the cafeteria brings it to their room, they're going to look at it and go, man, I don't like none of that crap. It tastes like crap. I don't want it. So sometimes you may have patients that have a failure to thrive. They don't want to eat. They don't eat the same things they used to. Um, their intestines don't contract, contract and move food like they used to. Um, some people may, man, I can't tell you how many times I go to um, a nursing home and I take a patient and uh, they have impaction, right? They have to go to the, the ER and have the doctor do a, uh, a digital removal of, of stuff in their colon because they don't have the enzymes. They don't have the saliva. They're dehydrated. They don't drink like they used to. Um, gallstones are increasingly common. Uh, anal sphincter changes have fecal incontinence. A lot of uh, a lot of digestive stuff happens when you go or does not any, like any other organ does not as work as well as it used to. Um, renal system. Uh, filtration function declines. Of course, kidney mass decreases. Kidneys get smaller, less able to produce the amount of urine output they used to. Uh, prostate issues ensue. Um, the decreased ability to clear waste from your body. Um, and of course, not able to conserve fluids. So all this, like I said, I'm reading from the slides, guys. You can read it just like I can. And most of you know this, um, especially if you've been in healthcare for more than five minutes. Um, you know, the elderly people have a hard time. A lot of them have, uh, have diapers. A lot of them have prostate issues. A lot of them have a hard time urinating. They have urinary catheters, Foley catheters that have to be <laughs> replaced often. Uh, sometimes they pull the catheters out. They call an ambulance to take them to the hospital, get them put back in. Sometimes they're waiting return transfers. But this is something that if you're at EMS, um, this is going to happen on, a, on the daily. Like one of your calls most likely is going to be, yep, lots of diapers. One of your calls on a routine basis is going to be fully peg to replacement, stuff like that. Um, and of course, these people are going to be dehydrated. Now, you're going to ask the staff at the nursing home, hey, have they been eating and drinking okay? Yep, just like normal. But their, their ability to retain those fluids gets worse over time. So they can still be dehydrated, even having the normal um, metabolic functions, normal eating habits that they're typically used to. Um, they can still be dehydrated. Okay, so nervous system, obviously, um, these people aren't gonna move as, not gonna be uh, toting around cat-like reflexes at this uh, age. Uh, and like I said, we're still talking about, you know, 60, 70, 80 year old um, individuals. Motor and sensory neural networks become a lot slower. You have afferent and efferent nerves that come down your peripheral brain and spinal cord. And when you're younger, when you touch something hot, you touch it, you immediately pull back. As you get older, that reaction is a lot slower. Um, they don't work as, as fast as they used to, and sometimes some, these injuries can be a lot worse because um, you don't have the reaction time that you used to. Um, <laughs> stay up all night and sleep all day. Um, so your neurons uh, are lost, but there's no loss of knowledge or skill. So your knowledge and skill, your memories, knowledge and skill, uh, and your brain doesn't change. Um, your ability to move as fast as you used to does change. Sleeping patterns change. Somebody just put, you know, elderly people into um, my mom. My mom's like 75, 75 now. And uh, she does. She reads books and watches Netflix till like three in the morning. And then uh, she'll wake up, eat breakfast, take a nap, and then she'll wake up again and think it's the next day and double take her medicine. She's not crazy. She's just getting old. Um, and as you get older, you, know, you take naps when you want. Man, I wish I had that life. I could sleep just whenever I wanted to and not go to work. That'd be cool. But we got to wait till we're old to do that stuff, guys. But your sleep patterns do change. Um, let me see. Sorry. I definitely should have took naps as a child when my mom tried to make me. You weren't. You didn't take naps when your mom made you? I should have. Yeah, looking back, man, I wish somebody would stop me midday and tell me to take a damn nap. I would do it in a second. I'd probably have a beer first. Um, nope, Matt, can't take a nap yet, bro. You gotta wait till the end of the lecture. All right, so nervous system. <laughs> Everybody's like, I love naps. Fair enough, I love naps too. 
um, nervous system. So your, your brain and spinal cord, your cerebrum, cerebellum, stuff like that, over time, you have, of course, your nervous system has synapses, right? Your synapse, you have a synaptic cleft and it has norepinephrine and different neurotransmitters that go back and forth. As you get older, these synaptic clefts don't work as well as they used to. Your thinking, your thought processes, your, um, your actions are, are a little slower than they used to be. Um, you do have shrinkage uh, in your, your brain. Um, the void between the brain, the outermost layer of meninges, um, you have more cerebral spinal fluid and stuff in there. Your brain can rattle a little bit more than it used to uh, as you get older. Um, I was trying to look. This slide is kind of small on my page. I was trying to see the little get this in here. All right, so... Anyway, so you guys can see here, there's more room for a little bit more damage. If you have a brain bleed at 70 versus a brain bleed at 30, um, there's more room for blood to collect here, more pressure, more. Um, oh, look at you, page 254. I don't have the book in front of me. So if anybody else sees it, page 254, apparently that's where we're at. Um, anyway, so nervous system changes. You know that this stuff over time, just like every other organ, is not as effective, does shrink and, and loses some of its ability as you get older. Um, okay, I just kind of hit on this. Peripheral nervous uh, sensation is diminished. So peripheral, so your central nervous system is what? Your brain and spinal cord, right? That's just your brain. How many holes do you have inside your skull? This is a pop quiz, by the way. You're getting graded on this. One, right? Your magnum foramen, the back, back of your skull, your spinal cord comes through it. That's your brain and spinal cord, your central nervous system. Your peripheral nervous system, everything in your fingers and toes, that's your afferent, efferent nervous system. That is what gets slow over time. Like I said, you touch something that's hot stove, you're not going to be as quick to move away as you would. You may have worse injury because of your reaction time. Um, longer delays between stimulation and motion. Um, Y'all may disagree with me. However, I feel like I'm right on this particular subject. I think the older you get, I think what you hit maybe 70, 75, I don't know the age but I think you should probably take an annual driving test or maybe every two years. Um, Cause a lot of the elderly people don't have the reaction time. It's almost like a bunch of drunk people driving around out there. Does that make sense? I don't know, maybe I'll disagree, I don't know. I just think as you get older and your reaction time drops, uh, operating a 3000 pound vehicle at 70 miles an hour should be, I don't know, you should probably send your grandkids or get an Uber, I don't know. Anyway, like I said, that's, uh, that's not on the test. That's just my thoughts for the day. Um, older people can't, they can see and hear pretty well. Some people that can't, of course, they, you know, they have glasses, they have hearing aids, stuff like that. One of the things that you'll hear in many textbooks and you'll see online is, is the EMT taking their stethoscope and putting it in the patient's ear and then they talk into the bell, say, Miss Jones, you know, we're here to blah, blah, blah. There's certain things you can do. Um, just don't scream at these people. It's so hilarious seeing new EMTs up there because they'll go to an older person's house and this 19 year old little EMT is like screaming at grandma. Like, what is wrong with you today? And grandma's like, nothing, I'm fine. Why are you yelling? Yeah, um, so I, don't make I want to chime in on that one. I was kind of waiting for it. So most people, when they're yeah. hearing, they're losing frequency ranges. It's not the volume, unless they had a life on a flight line or at a you know concert venues or something. A lot of times it's not volume. Shouting at them is a great way to piss them off and yeah. not want to deal with you. A lot of times the hearing ranges is, is, or the hearing loss is in the range of your of your your pitch. So try talking in a lower, a deeper voice, that kind of thing, because they may not be able to hear the, the the range that you normally speak at. That could be the problem. So try that. You know, um, if it's volume related, you can even ask. We're like, you know, if you got hearing loss, what's what's your issue? Is it that you can't hear me volume wise, or is it something else? A lot of times it winds up being pitch. So, you know, like Mike said, you catch somebody right out of school, they're screaming at them, what is wrong with you? That usually is, that's a great way to get something thrown at you. That's how you test the reaction time to see how fast they can throw things at you. It's a good, it's a test. All right, so um, visual distortions are common. A lot of these people are gonna have their peripheral vision. Like right now, if you put your hands out to your side and look straight ahead, most of us younger folks, I say younger folks, I like that tell myself I'm younger, can see, like right now with my hands beside my head, I can see my fingers move. My peripheral vision is still pretty good. 
Um, that's something that somebody having a stroke, they may not be able to see peripheral on this side or this side or vice versa. But the elderly, a lot of times things have to maybe more more in front of them, tunnel vision to see it. So you lose that as you get a little older. Um, glasses or hearing aids. Um, I'm not I'm not rocking my Mac Daddy glasses right now, but I I had a um, I had laser surgery in the army in 2004 to correct my vision, and then of course in 2018 I had to get glasses because that went away. So as you get older, and that's just in the span of 20 years, and I'm 40, so think about somebody who's 60, 80, 85. Um, their their vision may change a lot more rapidly than it did for me. So. Um, about five years before death, people retain high brain function. So the thoughts and memories of some guy that was in World War II, they don't go away. You know, they're there. Um, but their brain function is, is, is still at its pinnacle. It's at its peak. Their ability to, to get that out or to act or to move um, goes away, but not their brain function. You know, they can still do add and subtract and do math and, um, and think like they used to. They just can't move like they used to. Um, this is 95% of the elderly live at home. I don't know if that's regional, territorial, whatever the case is, but yeah, most of the elderly, and think about it, what would you guys want? You're elderly, uh, you have health problems, where do you want to be? You want to be with your family, you want to be at home? Um, a lot know, of them rather be at home content. Exactly, that's what they're used to, that's what they're, they can watch their own shows, their grandkids come over there, that's their... If I die, I want to be at a place that I'm familiar with, that my family can see me and I can go away and I'm familiar with that place. Um, they don't want to go anywhere else. They want to be home. Um, of course, financial limits may restrict access to health care or medications. Um, yeah, because of the neighbors, throw divers at the wall. You can get away with some pretty cool stuff when you're old. Um, so, <laughs> so financial limits may restrict access. This is true. I don't know how many of you guys have had to pay for an elderly person to be in a nursing home, but it's several thousand dollars a month. I mean, it's, it's a lot more expensive to have an apartment because you have to have 24 seven care. Um, so some of these people may not be able to have access to a nursing home or a, uh, uh, what's the one here in Ocean Springs, three to 6,000 a month. So yeah, that's a lot, man. That's, that's crazy. I couldn't afford that for my mom out of pocket if she didn't have insurance, you know, um, three to 6,000 a month. It's nuts. Um, so, yeah, staying home and having home health care come in a couple times a week. Okay, somebody's been, so, yeah, and there's a lot of, we pick up a lot of patients that are frequent flyers that we pick up for dialysis from a nursing home three or four times, you know, three times a week. Um, and they do enjoy it. They got bingo, they get their hair done, they get three meals a day, they get to watch TV, roll around, meet other folks. Um, if they can afford it, it is a pretty, pretty decent life for them um, instead of being on their own at the house waiting for somebody to come take care of them. Um, isolation and depression. I think I, I hit on this earlier. Um, if you guys have never heard the term failure to thrive, these are people that get put in a nursing home, their family quits visiting, <clears throat> they lose interest in activities. Um, sorry, I'm trying to read those comments too. Um, you know, and they just really, they're like, man, screw this. I'm ready to check out. <sighs> they want to leave. They're, they're ready to, um, they've had a good long life. They're tired of it. They're ready to go. And that's failure to thrive. They quit eating. They get emaciated, they quit drinking, um, they get skinny, and then they just, they wither away. And this is uh, isolation and depression on the bottom line there. That's one of those things that can hit these people really hard. All right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Good. Yeah. So that, all right. So that's it for the lecture. The next few slides are all reviews. I usually don't bother with them because they're going to get a lot of that in their tests. But, um, and plus, you know, y'all have your slides, you all have access to these. So if you do want to go through the review questions, you can always get them and, and go through them. But um, something else I want to add, you know, we, we talk about elderly adults and where they want to be and, and stuff like that. A lot of them, are, we, a lot of them will kind of shut down around you because they're afraid that they're going to lose that. So just like, like how the teenage daughter or teenage girl will lie about possibly being pregnant around her parents, a lot of times elderly will lie to you or just not want you to treat them because they're afraid that they're going to wind up in a nursing home that they don't want to be in. They want that. They want to keep their freedoms. They've had it there almost their entire life. As far back as they can remember all their adult life, they've had that independence. Um, so sometimes you'll, you'll 
come across that. And something that you can take from this chapter when you are dealing with elderly is have a proactive mind when you go into an elderly person's home. If you walk in and you see like there's a, there's a huge rug on the floor that's all jumbled up that could be a tripping hazard, go ahead and straighten it out. Pay attention to how it feels if it's cold in the house. Um, elderly don't really handle temperatures that well like they like they did when they were younger. So what's warm to you might be actually kind of cold to an elderly. So if you walk in and you're cold, they're very cold. Um, a lot of these things, if you can fix these along the way, it helps minimize the chance that something's going to go wrong. Like fixing the rug might stop them from falling and breaking a hip, that kind of thing. And it just makes it, A, it makes it better and safer for them. It also just makes it to where you don't necessarily have to respond as much reactively. Um, because, you know, a broken hip in an elderly patient could be a life threat. And yeah, just be a caring person. Take care. You know, and even say like, you know, get to know them. Be like, hey, my name is Rob. You know, I'm an EMT. I'm, I'm here to help you if you need me. I noticed that your rug is is kind of jumbled up over there and I didn't want you to trip on it. So I went ahead and straightened it out and, you know, take a look around. Just see if there's anything else that you can be proactive about. Because the less chance they have of getting hurt, the more likely they are to be able to stay independent, stay where they're at. And it just, it's good. It's good community relations and it's, it's, it's good for the soul. You know, you make a good, you make a friend, you make life better for somebody. It's nice to be able to do something proactive and stop somebody from getting hurt rather than always responding to an injury and waiting for something bad to happen before we do anything. Um, but anyway, your pin for the night is going to be B as in Bravo, C as in Charlie, 07. L is in Lima. BC07L. There you go. Thank you for typing that up. If anybody got any questions for me, Mike? Are you saying L07L? Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it was typed into the chat if you need to see it. Well, my chat and I don't I don't know what's going on with my computer today. Oh, okay. Uh yes, sir, it's L. <clears throat> All right, guys. So um Mike is gonna wind up being your lead instructor for this class. He will teach, he's got a busy schedule, he won't be teaching every night, but he will be the default instructor from here on. And I will be supplementing him. You also may get a class from our med director. He likes to teach. And it'll be good to get him in there so you can kind of get that point of view from a doctor and how we interact with them, how you'll interact as we, as you go through your career field and everything. Especially, I might have him come in and talk on cardiac emergencies one night because that one's heavily dependent on online protocols where you're actually calling med control. So it'll be a good one for that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, Mike's a good guy. Like I told you all I'm tooting his horn while he's in the class, but I mean, he's very well spoken. He's really smart. So he's going to be a fantastic instructor for y'all. I've got no concerns about this class. Um, and I'll be, like I said, I'll be in and out. I'll be teaching on things he can't make it. So you guys are, will be your, pretty much your instructor cadre for the rest of this lecture. All right. All right, guys, I'm going to go ahead and kill the recording. Um, that is it for the night. If you all need anything, hit us up on Facebook or you can shoot me a message, anything like that. Have a good night, and I'll see you on Wednesday.